In the pursuit of exploring linguistic origins, the attempt to find a Hebrew origin for all languages dominated the discourse. European languages were classified as Japhetic. This was an attempt to fit all languages within the biblical tradition of the dispersal of mankind after the Tower of Babel and the catalogue of languages and peoples set out in Genesis chapters 10 to 11. This began to be challenged following the Renaissance, with a growingly secular and nationalist lens being worn by scholars of European nations. This nationalistic pride even went as far as people believing that their own mother tongues were the original primeval language, such as Johannes Goropius Becanus with Dutch. One of the first to challenge the theory of Hebrew being the original ancestor of European languages was Joseph Justus Scaliger, who identified four major European language groups based on their words for God, Deus, Gott, Boch, and Theos. Note that the Spanish Dio may be a lesser known or archaic form, as it is usually Dios. However, he believed that these language groups were unrelated and was generally very cautious about connecting languages together. Around this time, increased missionary activity in India led Europeans to study its languages, uncovering interesting similarities between these languages and their own. In 1583, the Jesuit missionary Thomas Stevens, the first Englishman known to have reached India via the Cape of Good Hope, commented on the numerous languages around Goa, stating that their pronunciation is not disagreeable and their structure is allied to Greek and Latin. The phrases and construction are of a wonderful kind. In 1585, the Florentine merchant and literateur Filippo Sassetti, who was in Cochin, wrote a report on Indian culture in which he mentioned that India's sciences were written in a language so different from the vernacular that it required six years of study. In 1586, in a fragment of a letter, he referred to Sanskrit by name, mentioning again its status as India's learned language, much like Greek and Latin for Europeans, but stated that Indians devoted much more time to studying it, about six or seven years. He noted that contemporary Indians could not say when it was a spoken language, even though they had an extensive knowledge of their history. He pointed out some lexical similarities between Sanskrit and Italian, which persisted in the modern vernacular. Sei, shat, sette, satta, otto, ashta, nove, nova, dio, diva, serpe, serpa. During the Renaissance, Europeans rediscovered Persia and its language, and many scholars noticed similarities between Persian and Germanic languages, leading to the Persian-German theory. Paulus Merula, a professor at Leiden University, supposedly drew up a list of Dutch and Persian words which may have included the following. Choda. God. Peder. Vader. Mother. Mother. Baroder. Broeder. Dochter. Dochter. Nam. Na. Dandu. Tanden. Lab. Lip. Setore. Ster. Mush. Muis. Band. Band. No. Nieuw. Note that Huda and Hot are false cognates as they actually come from different roots. A testimony by the Greek historian Herodotus played a major role in the development of this theory. In the first book of Herodotus's Historiae, a Persian tribe called Germanioi is mentioned. Although some modern scholars believe that the term Germanioi actually referred to the Carmanians, the similarity to Germani led to speculation about the historical and genetic connection between the two tribes, a belief that even persisted into the 19th and 20th centuries. Justus Lipsius, a Flemish philologist and philosopher, in his 1589 edition of Tacitus's ethnological treatise Germania, made a comment on the passage on the Germans' impressive drinking skills. Xenophon writes something similar about the Persians at the end of the eighth book of the Chiropedia. It is astonishing, for I have meticulously noted this in a comparative study, to what extent the Persians are similar to the Germans in about their whole way of life, even in their language. He noted similarities between Dutch and Persian words, but also pointed out that many Persian words seemed more similar to Latin than German. 
questioning the exclusive relationship between Persian and Germanic languages and the usefulness of language comparison. Another scholar, John Greaves, observed that many Persian words are similar to English ones, but provides both English and Latin equivalents to the Persian words. Evlia Chilibi, an Ottoman explorer during his visit to Vienna, noted similarities between German and Persian. For example, German Tochter, Persian Tochter, German Bruder, Persian Brudar. Nemche is a very difficult language in which there are many Persian words. Chelebi believed the reason for this was that the German speakers had originated from Persia. Johannes Ehrlichman, a Silesian physician who served in the Persian court and also a renowned Orientalist, in contrast to the prevailing explanations of the time, believed that the similarities between Persian and German should be attributed to a common Scythian origin. He is said to have compiled a comparative word list made up of over 2,000 entries and planned to publish an Archaeologia Harmonica. However, Ehrlichman died somewhat unexpectedly on the 18th of August 1639 after a short illness, preventing him from doing this. Thankfully, due to the evidence provided in some humanist letters, Ehrlichman's views can be reconstructed to some extent. In 1647, artifacts related to the goddess Nehelenia washed ashore in Zeeland, modern-day Netherlands. The name Nehalenia was of unknown origin, and scholars at the time rushed to try and propose possible etymologies. Marcus Suerius van Boxhorn, a professor of rhetoric at Leiden University, used this opportunity to make a Scythian observation on the name Nehalenia, which was his first public postulation of his Scythian theory. Boxhorn viewed the name as the Latinized form of Nehalent, that is, Zehalent, which sounds like Zeelont. Nehalent, or Zehalent, were derived from the German Ealent, from the French O, and the Latin Aqua. He deduced that Ea, or A, stood for water, so he thought that Ealent, or Alent, must mean Vaterland, or waterland, land surrounded by water. Boxhorn then took one small step to conclude that the word was Eilent, or Eiland, meaning island. Boxhorn's crucial message in 1647 was that Germanic languages showed close similarities with Persian, and that these similarities were the result of Germans and Persians descending from common ancestors that spoke more or less the same language. He identified these common ancestors as the ancient Scythians, or Siths, and their language, Scythian, still spoken in Boxhorn's own days by the Siths or Tartars, who are of the same blood as we are, was the common origin of the Germanic languages and Persian. Van Boxhorn later expanded on this theory, stating that the true reason for the similarities in these languages is that the Greek and the Dutch lay at the breasts of one mother and learnt to speak from one mouth. This one mother, according to him, was the Scythian language. In his publications, he demonstrated that the following languages derive from Scythian. Greek, Latin, Persian, Old Saxon, Dutch, German, Danish, Swedish, Russian, Lithuanian, Czech, Croatian, and Welsh. He emphasized that loan words should be excluded from language comparison, stating that one should compare words which denote matters or things which are used, born, or encountered on a daily basis. Claudius Salmasius, who van Boxhorn had originally described his Scythian theory to, also notably later included Sanskrit in the Scythian family. The Scythian theory became widely known to other scholars, so much so that in 1733, Theodor Walter, a missionary in Malabar, recognized similarities between Sanskrit, Greek, and Persian numerals, and explained his observations with the Scythian theory. In 1686, Andreas Jäger stated, an ancient language, once spoken in the distant past, in the area of the Caucasus Mountains, and spreading by waves of migration throughout Europe and Asia, had itself ceased to be spoken, and had left no linguistic monuments behind, but had, as a mother, generated a host of daughter languages, many of which in turn had become mothers to further daughters, for a language tends to develop dialects, and these dialects, in the course of time, become independent, mutually unintelligible languages. 
Descendants of the ancestral languages include Persian, Greek, Italic, whence Latin and in time the modern Romance tongues, the Slavonic languages, Celtic, and finally Gothic and the other Germanic tongues. Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, the German polymath who invented calculus alongside Isaac Newton, like Scaliger, rejected Hebrew as the origin of all languages, but still favoured the idea of a proto-language. He hypothesised that a common language existed for both Europe and Asia, and that these are split into Japhetic in the north and Aramaic in the south. He preferred to call the first branch Celtocythic instead of Japhetic which he defined as the common ancestor of Celto-Germanic and Greek. Following a long-standing tradition in German scholarship, Leibniz extended the territory of Germanic far to the east to comprise the languages of the Sarmatians, ancestors of the Slavs, and the Tatars. However, he observed that the Slavs were very different from the Germans, and he linked them with the Huns. Ultimately, Leibniz placed the origin of the northern languages in Scythia, from where the Japhetic tribe, following the course of the sun, migrated. William Wotton, an English theologian, demonstrated that Icelandic, which he called Teutonic, the Romance languages, and Greek, were related, stating, Not one European language that is derived from a Greek or Teutonic stock declines its verbs any otherwise than according to an active or a passive form. Not one of them affixes possessive pronouns to the nouns to which they belong. He explains that the lack of grammatical similarities between Hebrew and these European languages implies that any similarities should be explained in terms of borrowings. However, in regards to other languages in Europe, he stated, let any man look here in Europe into the Finnish tongue and its dialects, the Esthish and the Lettish, let him examine the Hungarian which is a language entirely different from any other spoken in Europe. Wotton was one of the first, if not the first, to postulate the idea of reconstructing the ancestral proto-language of these related languages. My argument does not depend on the difference of words, but upon the difference of grammar between any two languages, from whence it proceeds that when any words are derived from one language into another, the derived words are then turned and changed according to the particular genius of the language into which they are transplanted. I can easily suppose that they might both be derived from one common mother, which is and perhaps has for many ages been entirely lost. James Parsons, a physician and fellow of both the Royal Society and the Society of Antiquaries, published The Remains of Japhet, being historical inquiries into the affinity and origins of the European languages, in 1767. He listed many comparisons between European and Asian languages that showed an undeniable link, for example, in numerals. In 1768, the Jesuit missionary and early Indologist Gaston Laurent Cardoux, in his memoir, wrote about India and its languages and culture. Cardoux, regarding the origins of Sanskrit, stated, The Sanskrit language is that of the ancient Brahmins. They arrived in India from lands north of that country, from the Caucasus, from Tartary, which was populated by the descendants of Magog. Of the children of Japheth, some spoke Greek, others Latin, others Sanskrit. Before their total separation, the communication they had together mixed their languages a bit, and traces have remained of this ancient mix in the common words that subsist still, and of which I have reported a portion. Here are some examples of words that Kurdu compared. God, Sanskrit, Deva, Latin, Deus, Greek, Chaos, Foot, Sanskrit, Padam, Latin, S, Pedis, Greek, Fus, Podos, Widow, Sanskrit, Vedva, Latin, Vidua. Great, Sanskrit, Maha, Greek, Megas. Note that Theos and Deus are false cognates. The correct cognate in Greek would be Zeus. He also suggests that Slavic languages are related to this family. Kurdu's account was sadly only published in 1808, and otherwise might have had a much larger impact had it been published nearer to the time of writing. 
Sir William Jones, despite being far from the first to discover these linguistic connections, is the most famous. Jones was quite well known in his time, being renowned for his Persian grammar and his translations from Greek, Persian and Arabic. Through his translations of Hindu legal texts, he made Sanskrit well known in Europe. By 1772, Jones had established a reputation as the foremost expert of Oriental studies in England. His familiarity with 28 languages allowed him to compile word lists, such as the following words for mother. When he went to colonial India to serve as a judge, intellectuals were literally expecting him to make major discoveries there. The Asiatic researches, which were distributed and pirated throughout Europe, ensured that his third anniversary discourse would have a huge impact. Like most, if not all, of the previous scholars, he made errors in classification, and many of his theories of origin were incorrect. This was likely inspired by a biblical interpretation of linguistics, which was common at the time. However, it can be argued that his work was much less accurate than his predecessors. Going back to the previous word list, he grouped Arabic as being related to most of these other languages, but denoted Slavic and Hindi as being unrelated. He notably ascribed Hindi to a Tartarian or Chaldean origin, to which Sanskrit then supplanted it after arriving with conquerors. He classified the Iranian languages, Pahlavi, Pashto and Belochi, and even an Austronesian language, Malay, as Semitic languages. He denoted Tibetan as coming from Sanskrit. He also grouped a number of languages and peoples such as Etruscans, Ethiopians, Egyptians, Chinese, Japanese and ancient Mexicans and Peruvians with Indians and believed that they shared a common origin. These are just some examples of his errors as there are many more. Nevertheless, one of his discoveries which he revealed in the Third Anniversary Discourse on the Hindus delivered to the Asiatic Society on the 2nd of February 1786 remains the most famous quotation in the history of linguistics and was an important moment in the development of comparative linguistics. The Sanskrit language, whatever be its antiquity, is of a wonderful structure, more perfect than the Greek, more copious than the Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either yet bearing to both of them a stronger affinity, both in the roots of verbs and the forms of grammar than could possibly have been produced by accident. So strong indeed that no philologer could examine them all three without believing them to have sprung from some common source which perhaps no longer exists. There is a similar reason, though not quite so forcible, for supposing that both the Gothic and the Celtic, though blended with a very different idiom, had the same origin with the Sanskrit, and the old Persian might be added to this family if this were the place for discussing any question concerning the antiquities of Persia.